They came to Cairo's airport looking for loved ones. For relatives of some of those on board the Egypt airplane, it turned into an agonizing wait for answers. My daughter was a flight attendant. We don't know anything yet, this woman says. We hear so many things, she says. We don't know if they are true or false. Air traffic controllers say the Egypt air pilot gave no indication that anything was wrong 42 minutes before the airliner vanished from radar screens. This is the plane, an Airbus A320 taking off in Europe last year. Early this morning, it went down in the Mediterranean Sea en route to Cairo. Greek officials say it appears the plane made two erratic turns, first veering to the left 90 degrees, then swerving right 360 degrees. The plane dropped sharply from 38,000 feet to 15,000. At 10,000 feet, air traffic controllers lost contact. A large search and rescue operation was launched with Egyptian and Greek aircraft and naval vessels hunting for the plane. Officials said some debris was found, but tonight Egypt Air said no, that is a mistake. So the search continues. As for the cause, Egypt's aviation minister urged caution, but he says the plane could have been brought down deliberately. The possibility of having a different action or go, uh, having a terror attack is higher than the possibility of having a technical... Uh... Is there any intelligence? France and Egypt have launched investigations. Officials will look into those abrupt turns right before the plane disappeared to try to figure out whether a bomb was placed on board. It appears that there's been some catastrophic uh, event uh, at 37,000 feet uh, and the most likely uh, thing to have happened is actually some kind of an explosion inside the aeroplane itself. Some relatives of the victims were flown to Cairo to wait for word on the investigation, but officials cautioned that it could take some time to say what brought down Egypt Air Flight 804. Derek Stoffel, CBC News, Jerusalem. I'm David Curley of ABC News in Washington, D.C. on a Facebook Live broadcast with Colonel Steve Ganyard, one of our consultants here at ABC News, and unfortunately here to talk about the crash of an Egypt air aircraft earlier today, an A320. This is actually the aircraft. Uh, it went down, Steve, after a flight from Paris to Cairo. It was well into its flight. Uh, at cruising altitude. That is the safest part of flight, right? It is, and it was almost at the end of its flight. It had been on the same heading at the same altitude for hours. It was about 20 minutes out, so it was about to hit, the, about to descend when the aircraft went down. Just north in the Mediterranean, northwest of Cairo. This is a relatively safe plane. What do we know could happen at 37,000 feet when all of a sudden it disappears from radar? It, it's a great airplane, and there's no reason in the world that this airplane should have just disappeared at 37,000 feet. The weather was good. There was nothing to suggest a mechanical failure, but the data just stops at 37,000 feet, which suggests some sort of a catastrophic event, which is why investigators are thinking first priority is to look for bomb. And terrorism possibly connected to the bomb. That, and, and that's because if something went wrong with the aircraft, an engine, the pilot might have had time to actually do a mayday call. There was no mayday call. There's no distress call. The airplane didn't move. It was just on, on one heading at one altitude, and all of a sudden, nothing. Now, we have reports from the Greeks uh, that they've actually seen some debris. The data gives us a pretty good idea of where to look for this aircraft. It's very important to find this aircraft. What answers will the wreckage and the black boxes reveal? So a couple things. Normally we're going to look for the black boxes because it'll give us not only a cockpit voice recorder, but it'll give us all the data on the airplane. But forensic investigators can hear and listen. If there was a bomb on board, they can actually triangulate from the microphones in the cockpit and tell exactly where the bomb went off in the airplane, if it was a bomb. And if it wasn't a bomb, a structural failure. Even the Egyptian official today who spoke, the civil aviation minister, who didn't want to say even that the aircraft was lost, he mm -hmm. was calling it missing, but then at the end of the news conference basically said, well, it's more likely terror than technical because these aircraft are so safe. They are so safe and they're strong. There's no reason that an airplane should drop out of the sky, which is one reason why we need to get to the wreckage, which is at the bottom of the Mediterranean right now. That wreckage will be able to tell us what kind of bending, what kind of twisting movements. Was it due to an explosion? Was it some sort of a metal fatigue? But that's why it's not only the black box, but the wreckage itself that's going to be cleaned. So both the black boxes will be important, the cockpit voice recorder, the flight data recorder, and the actual structure of the fuselage. Now, as the map shows us, this flight started in Paris and was going to Cairo. 
If a bomb was planted in Paris, that's disturbing news, isn't it? It is. So if there was an inside job, you know, I'm, I'm sure that the, the, the French are doing a very good job on screening people. But that doesn't mean that all the cargo is, is screened well. And it doesn't mean that somebody, what we call a dirty, dirty handler, might have been paid off to throw a satchel charge in the cargo hold at the last minute. So highly unlikely that it was somebody who had a bomb on their person, much more likely that it was something placed in the cargo hold. Now, it's interesting. The plane had just entered Egyptian airspace. Uh, if somebody had planned it and wanted to, in essence, make an attack against Egypt, mm -hmm. Uh, that starts to add up to having a bomb go off as you enter the airspace. It does. So if we think back, what was the last major uh, mishap in this region? And it was the, the Russian airliner coming out of Sharm el-Sheikh. So the intent there by ISIL uh, was to cut down on Egyptian terrorism, to scare people away from visiting uh, Egypt because it would cut off a source of funds for the Egyptian government. So we don't know whether it's directed at Egypt if it's a bomb, or we don't know if it's directed at France. We know that both countries have had a problem with terrorism in the recent past, and so they're going to have to look at both countries and look at it then. You mentioned the cargo hold. This aircraft in the two prior days went to Eritrea, I believe, mm -hmm. and to Tunisia. Yes. Could something have been planted in a plane, you know, days earlier and not been taken out? It, it, it could have been, but whoever planted that bomb would have had to have been very lucky to, to have the, the bomb not go off in a previous flight, sit overnight, and then take off again and have the airplane blow up in the air. So is it possible? It's possible, but the timing would have been very difficult, and I'm not sure that we've seen that sort of level of sophistication out of the terrorists in this part of the world. Let's just go through what's happening. So we have an air and sea search during the daylight hours. Uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, in the, the general GPS area where we lost data. Mm -hmm. uh, then what? Uh, sonars to listen for the pingers? Yes, yes. So hopefully the pingers will be there. The, the, you know, think back to the Malaysian Flight 370 that we still haven't found. The pingers went 30 days. We still couldn't find it. The, sh the depths here in the Mediterranean are much more shallow, and we have a much better idea of where the airplane went down. They'll just have to extrapolate the heading and distance to be able to find the general area where the plane went down. Then they can get the pingers into the water. Once they get the pingers, they'll know the general area of the, of the debris pattern on the bottom of the ocean, and they can bring in the, uh, the salvage crews. And the salvage crews, I mean, if we know where it is, that's helpful. It doesn't matter then if it takes 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, at least you know where it is. But this is not going to be pulling this wreckage up in the next couple of weeks. No, it's going to take time. And, and, but the good news is that if we do find it, we'll find the black boxes. We find the black dot boxes. They go with the data we already have. And I think it'll be pretty clear that we'll have an answer to this mystery within the next weeks, if not months. As somebody who's involved in the aviation community, the intelligence community as well, uh, what does what happened to this aircraft tell you? Uh, it, it's quite concerning from a uh, perspective of we don't know which part of ISIS is, is operating here. If it is ISIS, is it terrorism that's co focused mostly on the Middle East, or is it the terrorism in Western Europe that we've seen in Belgium and France that's been so devastating? So figuring out what their intent was is going to be part of the clues of putting together who did it. Now, we've been having an intense debate in this country about TSA lines mm -hmm. because TSA changed their security methods after failing some tests right. last year. Um, and just last week, the Homeland Security Secretary said, we're not going to change our security. Does this event affect how you and I stand in line waiting for a plane in the U.S.? Well, I think that if we walked over to any of the U.S. or the uh, Washington, D.C. airports today, you wouldn't find too many people complaining about having to stay in line because they now understand why it's so critical. So, yes, TSA is having some backups, but let's not let down our guard and say, well, we're just going to let people through on an easier, on an easier search. So. It's important that we continue to screen and we continue to do the things we've done to keep us as safe as we've been. Finally, uh, there was a lot of discussion at the news conference of Egyptian journalists asking the Egyptian civil aviation minister who should run this investigation. Mm -hmm. There are rules internationally. Uh, it sounded like because Egypt has had some issues with aircraft mm -hmm. and investigations in the past, uh, that even some of the journalists in Egypt were asking whether the French, since it came out of Paris, uh, run the investigation. What are the rules from the United Nations about how this is going to be conducted. So in all likelihood, the wreckage came down inside of Egyptian territorial waters, or at least inside the region where they would be responsible. It was an Egyptian airplane, so the Egyptians will have the lead on this, but it's highly likely that they'll ask the French for help. The French are, are terrific aircraft mishap investigators, and they would be much better suited to be able to get to the bottom of this, uh, given how much technical uh, uh, forensics is going to be required. And once again, you think in a matter of weeks, we could have an answer? We could.
Colonel Steve Ganyer, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Always a pleasure to speak with you about aviation and what's going on. I'm David Curley, ABC News in Washington. Thanks for joining us on Facebook Live.